Welcome to the Cool Tools Show. I'm Mark Frauenfelder, Editor-in-Chief of Cool Tools, a website of tool recommendations written by our readers. You can find us at cool-tools.org. I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin Kelly, founder of Cool Tools. Hey, Kevin. Hey, it's great to be here. In each episode of the Cool Tools Show, Kevin and I talk to a guest about some of his or her favorite uncommon and uncommonly good tools they think others should know about. Our guest this week is Seth Raphael. Seth is a modern-day Robert Houdin combining cutting-edge technology with age-old magic techniques to push what's possible and elicit wonder. He studied magic and technology at MIT, and companies like Disney and Google hire him to help envision the future. And I just want to say that uh, I watched uh, Seth's performance on Penn & Teller's uh, Fool Me. It was an incredible performance, and uh, so I am so excited to have you on the show, Seth. Thanks. I'm so happy to be here. Yes, we're also proponents of wonder. And so we are so glad that you are cheering your wonder with us. Uh, and what, can't wait to hear what cool tools you have for us. Great. I'll, I'll go ahead and start with the first one, which is okay. actually a mindset. And I know it's a little unconventional, but for me, I feel this is the thing that keeps me creating. And it's a, a dual mindset that is first, just a sense of possibility and second, a passion of wonder. And when I say a sense of possibility, it means it's something that I come get from being a magician, which is a magician never thinks about something and thinks, oh, that's impossible. They think, oh, that's impossible. Let me do it. And it's something that I saw patterned with my dad. Oh, he would patch walls, even though that wasn't his day job. Anything that needed to be fixed, he would say, okay, we're just going to do it. And he would get out a tool. And somehow he had this wealth of knowledge <laughs> Of, of how to fix things. And it really instilled in me a belief, oh, if there's a challenge, if there's something broken, I can fix it. Uh, I can learn how to. And even if I don't succeed, you know, mistakes are part of our growth. And if, if, if I screw it up really bad, I can maybe hire someone to help me patch it up. And then the second part is just this constant seeking out of wonder. And i at MIT developed a model of wonder and where it comes from. And it, for me, I think it, it boils down to this experience of something unexpected that breaks your, your mental model of the world. And it gives you this little dopamine rush. And sometimes that can lead you to be fra- afraid if it's something scary, but if it's not something scary, there's an opportunity for it to open your mind and, and just give you this exciting glimpse at a world that is suddenly bigger than it was a moment ago. And for me, this uh, came from my mom. Uh, I remember as a child, her talking about the beauty all around of us and just how amazing our hand is. If everybody could just look at your hand and understand really how wonderful and how amazing it is that you can control this thing and that it grows from an egg into a human and the world would just be a much more peaceful and happier place if we had that mindset. And these two pieces came together in me in a sort of a, perhaps a mission you might say to instill wonder in adults around me in finding the things that people take for granted perhaps or when it comes to technology because that has been one of my specialties um if they think they've hit up against the limit of technology i have always thought okay what's what can we do to push beyond that to get to the next level and to do something that people thought was impossible and this has resulted in me tackling projects that I've had no, no right probably to even begin started with, you know, building flower boxes or gardening raised beds for my partner, Colin. And, and then the next step was to build a tree house. And I didn't know how to build a tree house and yet tackling it, I ended up with a tree house that instills wonder on people as they walk down the street, as it's just sort of floating there suspended in a way that not very many, if any tree houses are, were built before, because yeah, I came at it not from a, well, we need to go hire an engineer and draw up a plan, but let's just tackle it and see what happens. Is it like a tensegrity tower? Uh, almost. It's actually hanging from, from some of the upper branches. I live in the Pacific Northwest, and there are a lot of lumber companies who take fell big trees. So they had all these rigs for rigging up and carrying huge structures in the treetops. So I actually found an expert who could tell me how much I needed to, to lift and what rated cables I needed. And so it looks like it's a floating floating uh, platform, but it's actually hanging from the upper limbs. Cool. So, um, so you're, you're uh, a magician, and we don't 
often think of a workshop for magicians, but um, it sounds like you probably have a workshop to create your your magic tricks and tools. Is that true? I'm, absolutely. I, I'm kind of sitting in the midst of it. It surrounds me. I will say it's not a particularly uh, neat and tidy environment, but I look around right. and I see microcontrollers and Makita drills and a laser cutter and copper tape, uh, scissors and a bunch of a bunch of decks of cards uh, and a variety of things. Um, the most unusual things are frequently used when you're designing a magic trick. So give us a couple of your favorite tools that you use in making your magic. Well, this is a, a tool that I use not just in magic, but also in my technology development, because I also work in developing products uh, that are technology, pro technology products. And it's the Adafruit Huzzah 32, which is based on an ESP32 chip. And it's a microcontroller. It's a tiny little board. You can hold it in the palm of your hand. You can plug it into your USB uh, slot on your computer and charge it, or you can plug it into the wall. And it's just this unassuming little thing. It costs about 20 bucks. And he, for those who don't know, you, you take a, a microcontroller on a board and you give it power, but then you have to connect it to something in order for it to either see or sense the world or give you some sort of output in the world. And the beautiful thing about this particular board is um, Adafruit, the company that makes it and designed the, the Feather platform that it is built on, they have things that you can just sort of plug into it. You can plug in a speaker and suddenly this chip is now playing music. Or you can plug in LEDs or motors and make things spin and whir and light up. And you can plug in all kinds of sensors. So I used this very chip uh, when my kid, <laughs> we were having a conversation about yelling and he was like, I don't yell. <laughs> I was like, well, let's let's build something to see if that's true. So we took this chip and we wired up a, a little microphone and a little uh, old cell phone vibrating motor. And now suddenly he has something that he can wear around his neck and it vibrates on him when he's yelling. It's like, oh, we have realized, uh, okay, the way we perceive our own voice is not necessarily the way other people wear oh it. Oh my God, that's great. And so has that helped him like modulate his volume it has i think perhaps most importantly made him more receptive when i say hey finn or <laughs> you might be a little loud right now he's suddenly like oh okay i understand the difference <laughs> <laughs> that is so cool i love that yeah and so this board just makes it easy to take an idea and obviously i have tons of experience and this is something that you can actually like literally with a battery and led and some tape start making circuits and one by one grow your abilities till you can take any input, any, any output and, and stick it together. And the, the really cool feature about this chip is that it also supports Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, And that means that you can put this thing in it. Can it be connected to the internet uh, or it could be connected to a computer or a phone? And so the possibilities for this little board I've just found are a perfect balance of plug and play for the easy things and uh, the ability to scale up to do some more advanced projects. How similar or different is it from the Arduino? So you can use the Arduino IDE to program it, which I, mm -hmm. I love that environment. And there, um, there are more and more creative environments for programming. And I think this is a, a, a huge area that's ripe for the future in innovating how we communicate with these things. Um, currently, the, only the people who have uh, studied for a long time and done a lot of training can actually program microcontrollers. Now it's getting to the point where you can plug in some of these devices. And for this one that I used for my kid, when I plugged it in, it showed up as a, just a drive, and there was a file mm -hmm. on it. And that file was the, a little Python script. And I just type into that Python script, and every time I saved it, the, the board actually rebooted. So it didn't need to be powered or compiled or send things. It was just like a little file on my computer that I could type and it would run. That's but it so does, cool. I, it, it, it is. The abstractions are getting to a spot where um, you still need someone to hold your hand. And I think there's a lot of room for bringing new people into these platforms and making them more accessible, but it is getting a lot easier. And there's tons and tons of YouTube tutorials on this as well. There are, and I think this is where it comes back to my first tool, which is that mindset. Like, you really have to believe that you can do it or that it could be possible to even start down that path. And I think for a lot of people, it's just never even introduced as an idea that, oh, yeah, I could 
for 20 bucks, buy something and then start building something brand new, even if it's really basic at the beginning. Yeah, exactly. That's really great. So um, tell us about another of your favorite tools. Well, let's see. I'm going to hop back to one that is perhaps a, a little more generic again, and that's JavaScript. And JavaScript is a programming language, and most everybody who has used the internet has used JavaScript because it's the language that powers uh, your websites. And so if you have a website, if it does something interesting, it's probably using JavaScript. And I learned JavaScript many, many years ago. And one of the, one of the things that made it originally so exciting was you could look at any web page and basically peel back the hood and see the code underneath of it. You could copy the bits that you thought were interesting. You could tinker with it and change it. And over the years, it has uh, stuck as one of the most flexible languages that I know. Uh, I use it when I'm making a new magic trick frequently to write you know, a proof of concept and it can run in your browser. And it's gotten to the point where now servers can run JavaScript too, and you can run all the code on the front end and the back end. And with, with something like JavaScript, you could do, uh, you know, take the New York Times, pop open an article, and you can change it right in your browser without having to do anything on the server end. And now I could make perhaps a New York Times article that said, the best new podcast cool tools <laughs> with Mark and Kevin is featuring Seth Raphael. And I can make a screenshot really quickly and send it to my friends. So it's like, it's, it's the closest thing to, you know, scissors and razors and duct tape uh, on the internet and on computers. So that's why I love JavaScript. How do you recommend people learn about it? Like how, how can you learn JavaScript? Hmm. There are definitely tons of places online that have uh, tutorials. And I think one of the fun things to do is once you have gotten a basic concept of JavaScript, you can open up on your browser what's called the developer console. And that lets mm -hmm. you see the HTML and actually type in JavaScript that happens, uh, that, that runs for you automatically. Um, if you haven't ever coded before, there is a website called Replit, R E P L I T. And they allow you to start programming immediately, no matter what kind of computer you have, because it just opens a browser and you can type in JavaScript that they're actually running on their cloud machines on the back end. So that's one way to dive in if you don't want to try and install anything on your computer. And could you give me an example of using JavaScript to make a magic trick? I mean, uh, I'm not really sure how, what that would look like. Yeah. So my magic is high tech and, and tech related. So, I'll, I'll reveal a secret here of a magic trick I did many years ago, or at least part of it. And on stage, I would be blindfolded and I would have somebody in the audience name anything in the world. It could be an object, it could be a concept. And then they would go to Wikipedia and I would recite to them passages of that article that I had memorized from Wikipedia. And then I would say, oh, there's one more thing. Scroll down to the bottom and in the very last section, it would say, uh, on May 7th, Seth Raphael mentioned the concept of tensegrity uh, when he was talking to Kevin Kelly and Mark Fraunfelder. And so it would appear as if I had edited this Wikipedia article beforehand, knowing exactly which thing that my spectator would choose. But in fact, it was JavaScript that was running and secretly editing the page to make it look mm. as if it had that text on there. So okay, that's so that's cool. Cool. one example. Right, right, right. Okay, so... Um, do you have, um, and, and you say um, you use tools and stuff to make magic tricks. Um, um, you, the general, are you do mostly a mentalist kind of magic or do you do um, sleight of hand as well? Uh, I have historically done sleight of hand. Mentalism is the branch of magic where you pr pretend to read somebody's mind or predict their mm -hmm. behavior. And that for me has been really uh, very f uh, a fruitful path because computers, the interface between hu computers and humans is this thing that is slow. You've got to type, you've got to use a mouse, you've got to use a keyboard. And this concept of the computer being able to read your mind or knowing what you are going to want is something that's really ripe for you playing on that future of what might be possible and what we might hope to be possible. Mm -hmm. And so one of the very early magic tricks I developed um, lets you use Google and you would type into Google, what am I thinking of? And then Google would just give you a search result for exactly what you were thinking of. And so this is just a traditional old magic trick. Magicians have been doing this for you know, thousands of years, but it was redressed 
where the computer was reading your mind. And it was really impactful for a lot of people. And it kind of presaged things to come. This was before autocomplete existed. And eventually you get to the point where Google can kind of read your mind. (laughs) It knows so much about you. You'd start typing in, and yeah. it, sometimes it will just know exactly what you want to what you want to ask. Exactly, it's well, weird. I, actually, yeah. I, I depend on that now. I don't yeah. want to bother typing or trying to spell things. I will let Google read my mind, and I'm disappointed oh, yeah. when it doesn't. Oh yeah, we come to expect things. They go so quickly from yeah. delight to entitlement. <laughs> right. So, um, in in the same vein, do you have another uh, tool in your workshop um, or in your tool chest? Um, that you want to recommend to us? Yes. Uh, I have love communicating and talking and, and sharing the ideas and concepts that I'm playing with, and they change from time to time. And I found a great method for both learning about things, but also sharing is through podcasts. And podcasts is really, as we're doing right now, just fundamentally recording an audio a conversation or a transcript. But once you've done that, you're left with this pile of waveforms on the computer that need to, you've got to remove the ums, you've got to make sure all the levels are good, you've got to make sure that there aren't any pops or clicks, that, that your background music comes in nice if you have that, or themes. And that is a lot of work and can be one of the big bottlenecks in trying to create a podcast. And I found a tool called Descript that has really transformed the way I am able to produce. Descript takes your audio and turns it into a text document. So it's almost like you're looking at a Google Doc or a Microsoft Word Doc on your computer where it has taken your words, transcribed them into text, and you have a document right there. And anytime you click on a word and press play, it will play exactly what you what you spoke. And that means suddenly editing is really just like using a word processor. You delete the word ah, uh, you uh, drag this segment up to the other segment, and you're moving the waveforms under the hood, and you can play it back and hear how it sounds. You can add space in between words. You can change the... Uh, the timing or there's even a feature now where you can train it on your own voice. And if you misspoke a word or want to add a word, you just type it in and it uses uh, deep learning algorithms to generate the new audio for you in your voice. I've actually tried it before with a a sample. It's amazing. It's like so seamless. So so the idea is that there's a, a, like a transcript and this transcript is sort of matched to the audio file so that, um, by hitting the transcribed word, you hear exactly that sound and vice versa. You could look at the, exactly. listen to the audio and then see what the transcript says at the same moment. Okay. It, it time syncs every word that it transcribed right. into the actual audio file. And so when you click right. in the middle, it takes you straight there. Right. And is that um, a subscription? What, what's the economics of that? that? There is a free version. And then if you get to a certain point, I think it's, excuse me, 15 bucks a month. And then for a little bit more, you can get the, the voice creation. So the voice, the automatic, um, they call it overdub where it synthesizes the voices for you is more expensive per month, but there's a, there's a free plan and then a, a, a middle plan, which is, which is where I am right now. So, so the, 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 it's an AI that's doing the transcription. Is that right? Yeah. So they use a, a variety of services. They have an automatic one. And if you have perhaps you know, a more challenging piece of audio, you can actually get white glove transcription where somebody mm. will listen to it and correct the computer for you. Uh, mm. I don't need that for my purposes, but it, it works pretty well out of the box. Right. Do you have a, a regular podcast that people can subscribe to? I do. It's called the post modern magician. And it is a combination of background stories on the magic, uh, it, and how it relates to technology. So how the concepts in technology or in magic can be related to technology. Uh, For example, magicians use the technique called one ahead, where they're secretly one ahead from you and uh, you're only slowly catching up to where the magician actually is. And a, a strange but interesting way it applies to technology is I always have just one extra huzzah, that ESP32 board I mentioned earlier. I always have an extra one. I'm always one ahead because I never know when I want to start a new project. And that just lowers the friction and, the, and makes it faster for me to pick up a new project just by having one extra board around. 
That's cool. Wow. Okay. Um, so, Seth, you have a, a bonus um, suggestion, or depending on how we classify your first suggestion, well, yeah. what's another tool that um, you'd like to share with folks? Well, it's PBS Kids, and it's it's all the shows that PBS, the public broadcasting service in the United States, makes for kids. And it includes things like, if people remember Mr. Rogers, there's now an animated version called Daniel Tiger. It includes something called Odd Squad, which was a really silly uh, kids pretending like they're detect well, they are detectives in the show, and they solve math problems to capture villains. And the reason I put it down is because I've got kids, a range of kids from all, just about 10 down to three right now. And I struggle because the internet is such a big untamed place. It's not quite ready for, for kids. And PBS has been a place where I've found every show to just be safe. And I guess PBS kids is an example, but the, the real tool is finding trusted environments where you, you know that everything has been curated and your kids are going to have a, a, the ability to grow. So my 10 year old isn't only going to be able to watch PBS kids, but even something like YouTube YouTube Kids has such a wide variety. It's difficult to really line that up with what you are hoping your kids take from the world. And um, is, so this is, again, a channel on the internet that you just subscribe to? Um, yep, or... it's a website. They also have an app, so that if you want to give them a tablet or a phone, they can just pick mm -hmm. the shows they like. Are there any of them that you watch with your kids? Yeah, Odd Squad is pretty ridiculous. It has an absurdist sense of humor that mm -hmm. line, lines up with me, and uh, my kids, <laughs> my kids are developing a little bit of taste for that as well, which is nice. That sounds great. Yeah. So, um, why don't you tell us about uh, you have a, you have a Patreon about uh, magic and to help magicians? Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah. So. I just love making new magic. It is the, I can't stop. And it's like the lens I look through the world, no matter what I'm discovering. My first thought is, wow, how could I use that for a magic trick or what would a magic trick be? And I decided to share relatively recently some of the effects that I've created, the magic experiences that I have designed. And I put them up on Patreon and every couple weeks I put out a podcast describing how my theories about magic relate either to technology or to magic. And I actually give people the ability to try some of my magic uh, and, and actually perform it. So an example is an effect called strange flavored spam. And this came from my design process and my design process is to think about what's the experience or the emotion I want somebody to have, or what's a universal experience that would touch a lot of people and I came to the realization, hey, everybody gets spam calls and we all hate them. What if they were a little bit more magical? So a strange flavored spam, let's imagine that we were hanging out one night and we had been discussing a concept, maybe pastafarianism. Suddenly my phone would ring and I'd say, oh, no, it's the spammers again. They're getting really specific. I'd put it on speakerphone and it would start to talk about rebalance your credit card today and get a free Pastafarian t-shirt. <laughs> um, so, you know, as Ferdinando Buscema would say, we're, we're playing on that magical experience design. Is it real? Is it not real? It could be real. We're, we are there. Are we living in that reality? Will we soon or can we avoid it? And so that's an example of a magic trick that I, I share with my patrons. Cool. That's a really yeah, good I mean, one. You're kind of right on the. Um, you're exploring or deep mining the uh, Arthur C. Clarke, you know, the indistinguishable ability between magic and high tech, and um, that is a huge territory that um, could be explored for years. And I'm so glad you're at the frontier of that. Thank you. Yeah, Arthur C. Clarke said, "Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic." And my motto has frequently been the converse that any sufficiently advanced magic can smell an awful lot like technology. <laughs> right. Exactly. That's a good one. Right. Well, Seth, I want to thank you for taking the time to chat with us today. And uh, I highly encourage people to um, search on YouTube. We'll have a link to it actually, to see uh, your performance on Penn and Teller show, which 
was astounding. Thank you. Um, I don't think it's a spoiler to say that you fooled Penn and Teller. They couldn't figure it out. Um, and uh, uh, that, that will be something we'll link to. Thanks oh, so that, much, Seth. That's great. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It's been a, a joy and a pleasure talking to both of you. Yeah, and um, I am so glad that you are sharing this with, uh, sharing your love of wonder. That's just, just really a wonderful gift for the world. So thank you for sharing it with us as well. Well, thank you. Hey, everybody, it's your host, Mark, and I wanted to thank you for listening to The Cool Tools Show. And I also wanted to let you know that we've got a lot more going on at Cool Tools than just this podcast. We also have the Cool Tools website, which has a new tool review every day, and you can get there by going to cool-tools.org. We also have four different newsletters that you can subscribe to, and you can subscribe to those from the Cool Tools page. We have this podcast that you're listening to right now, We also have a YouTube channel where we review tools. Check that YouTube channel out by going to youtube.com slash cool tools. And one of the things I'd like to ask you is if you're really enjoying everything that we are producing, go to our Patreon page and support us there. You can sign up and give us as little as $1 a month, and that would mean a lot to us. The money that we get from Patreon goes towards a lot of things. We transcribe our podcast interviews so that you can read them online. We pay for editing of our podcasts and for our videos. We pay our contributors. We have video production costs. We have equipment costs. We have hosting costs. And the money you give us through Patreon also goes to support Cool Tools Lab. Anything you give is a huge help. And One of the things that we do is if you are a contributor to Patreon, we'll give you a shout out on air. And so I have a few people here to thank this week. Mark Lyonage, Micah Gates, Monty Zukowski, Patrick James McNally, Robert Cohen, Scott, Spence Lloyd, Steve Avery, Steve Golden, Steve Levine, Tom Hess, William Phillips, Aaron Nipper, Darab Patel, Glenn Mercer, Jay Walker, Jeff Bonaire, Ryan Jarrell, Pat Daly, Patrick Kennedy, Troy Wallet, Mike Camerate, Nicole Harkin, Tim Youssef, Scott Reed. Thanks all of you for supporting Cool Tools. And if you would like to have a shout out, go over to the Patreon page and sign up. And thanks for listening to the Cool Tools podcast. We'll see you next week.